Hello there. I think it's safe to say the NES didn't exactly do too well over here in the UK. Well, actually, that's quite an understatement. It pretty much bent over and pulled apart its bum cheeks for the other systems over here. This was mainly down to three issues. First of all, it was nigh on impossible to find one. Mattel, Nintendo's distributor in the UK, decided for some bizarre reason to avoid shops you expect to buy them from, such as Woolworths and Dixon's, and instead plump for chemists such as Boots and family-run indie department stores. Secondly, the prices for games were astronomical. Games would cost up to £70, this was in 1980s money as well, so putting up against competition like the Master Systems price of £25 a game, and home computer games going for as little as £1.99, it didn't really have a leg to stand on. And even if you were lucky enough to sell one of your kidneys to afford an NES game, there was no guarantee that the game would work on your version of the NES anyway, as there was two versions of the Nintendo Entertainment System on the market. The NES version, made by Nintendo, and the Mattel version. So why two versions of the NES for Europe, I hear you ask? Well, Mattel originally had the rights to produce NESs in Europe, but after Nintendo saw what a terrible job Mattel were doing with their console over here, they pulled the rights and released their own version. But I'll go into that in a later episode. Now you're probably thinking, us poor Brits didn't get to save the classic NES games at the time because of all the foobar shenanigans going on. But that couldn't be further from the truth. While we didn't exactly play them on Nintendo's little grey toaster, we played them on various other systems instead. Why? Well, let me take you on a journey to a very British guide to NES ports. Sometimes it can be shitty when there's a game you really want. You wait a really long time, it takes bloody years to come. But what about those games that you just don't get to play? They were not released in the US, but places like the UK. many friends But what does this have to do with the song? It's games that yanks can't whack Well we'll start today's episode off with a game that everybody knows Mainly because nobody ever shuts up about it. Contra. Probotector. Yeah, alright. Everyone and their mother knows that Konami pulled a Doki Doki Panic on our European bottoms and rebranded the Contra series as Probotector. But we've got the Germans to thank for that, due to their overly neurotic law at the time that banned violence to humans in video games. As it's a well-known fact witnessing the execution of a small, pixelated man on screen will somehow evoke the resurrection of Hitler and the Third Reich. Luckily, Ocean Software, who got the license for the UK, weren't pussies like Konami Europe, or should that be lazy so-and-sos, and made an exact port to the original. But alas, still didn't keep the Contra name, and was this time rebranded as Grisor. So why the name change this time? Well bizarrely we've got Konami to thank again for this, as it's actually based on the arcade game the same name that was released in Europe and Australia. It essentially is Contra verbatim, except for one difference. It was single player only. Bill and Lance just took turns to battle alien scum. Why? Absolutely no idea. Konami just had a knack at the time of rehashing the same game over and over for different countries for zero reason and this was just another of their endeavours. But anyhow, the pause. We'll start the ball rolling with everyone's favourite decagraphical computer, the ZX Spectrum. I'll be playing the 128K version of Gryzor for this feature, as it's regarded as the definitive version of the two, even though they both came on the same tape. But the only difference is between this and the 48k version, although it loads between levels, lacks in game music, and makes a bizarre farting noise whenever you fire a gun.
indeed. But as you can see, it's still limited to only 10 colours on screen. Hence why it's called a Spectrum. If you can look around the usual Spectrum trait of a lack of colours and colour clashing, it's actually a pretty decent conversion. Specky's had a knack for having good arcade ports, and this is no exception. It's not perfect by any means though. First of all, the colour clashing does make the enemy's large comedic tennis ball bullets practically invisible. So at some points you'll just be staring at the screen, wondering what the hell just killed you. And for some unbeknownst reason, you can't move left. At all. The second you'll try, you'll just stand still and still in that direction looking gormless. So dare you be half a molecule past a weapon grab you wanted, and forget about it. You cannot pick it up. It also makes jumping over bullets a pain too. Speaking of which, the three-way spread shot in the game, I call it a spread shot as they all go in the same direction, only the middle bullet actually kills the enemy. So it's absolutely zero difference from the default gun. There's also some bizarre boss moments in the game too. Like the first boss in the jungle. Nobody's home. And the second boss too. I mean, look at this shot. How am I supposed to avoid that? But I really need to mention it in the ending. Remember the epic scene of Lanson and Bill destroying the alien heart and escaping in a helicopter as the island explodes behind them? Well, you can forget about all of that in this version. Better than describe it to you, I'll just show it. Watch. One static congratulations screen. That's it. There's not even any ending credits. Well, I suppose at least they spelt congratulations correctly. <sighs> but aside from those problems, the ending, for some reason I just really enjoy playing it. It's hard as hell as you only get six lives and no continues, but it's just fun. But next up is a machine that's closest to the NES on a technological level, and also the only port to receive a later release in the US under the Contra name, the Commodore 64. In fact, Rare used to program their NES titles with one. Now you'd think having a machine so close, you'd have an eye on identical game to the Little Grey Toaster's version. But unfortunately, it can only be described as, well, crap. It's absolutely plagued with problems. First of all, I don't even need to mention that the game is just way too fast compared to the original, and also the fact all the enemies are yellow in this game. I mean, why? It looks like everyone you're fighting suffers from jaundice. There's also some bizarre changes in the game. Like, remember fighting a giant alien on top of the waterfall on level 3? Well, forget about that on this version. And also that bulldozer mini-boss. Oh yeah, he looks far more intimidating now. He looks like the car out of City Connection. And that boss on level 4. Sure, it's always been a cop-out, it's just a rehash of the second level's boss. But why the hell are you fighting moonwalking midgets this time around? The third-person base levels are an absolute nightmare too now. Instead of being able to shoot at three levels, you know, like in every other version, you now have to be absolutely pixel-perfect with your jumps. This makes some of the targets where you need to jump a total pain. And that's not forgetting all the annoying glitches in the game, too. I mean, look at this. Fantastic! It spawns me underneath a platform on the waterfall level, so I automatically fall off the screen with zero chance of getting over to that ledge in time. Why, thank you ever so much! Ugh! Bloody hell! Alongside the Spectrum version, the Commodore 64 port also has a rather interesting control method to play the game. Interesting meaning extremely annoying. Granted there's always going to be problems porting a game designed for two buttons to a one button machine, so they allocated the ability to jump to the spacebar on the keyboard. 
you do get used to it eventually, but playing Finger Twister on a prolonged gaming session will definitely get you a one-way ticket to Arthritisburg. But you're probably thinking, well surely it at least got a better ending than the Spectrum version, Larry. Well, you'd be wrong. They don't even have the decency to congratulate me this time around. So as you can tell, I don't like the Commodore 64 port. The game's too fast, too glitchy, too floaty, and there's far too many midgets in it for my liking. So not one to actively seek out. Unless you're stupid. And finally, last, but certainly not least, the Amstrad CPC version. Compared to the other two versions, the Amstrad had quite an improvement in the graphics department, albeit a little bit blocky. But they're by far the most faithful of the three ports, and are so good, I say they'd even give the arcade version a run for its money. Sort of. Though with the Amstrad, good graphics usually came at a price, and this time around it was having to sacrifice the scrolling. So we have this annoying static screen flipping thing going on, known in the trade as screen flicking, which, as good as the game looks, is really disconcerting to the point it can put you off the entire game if you're not used to it. Enemies will occasionally kill you instantly simply by being at the edge of the next screen over, and give you zero opportunity to avoid them in time. There's a few other annoyances too, like the fact that bridges don't explode on the Amstrad. Granted there's no animation with any of the backgrounds in the game, but for some reason they thought there should be explosions still, and this time they kill you for no apparent reason. No other version did that, so why with the Amstrad? The control method is also completely different to the Commodore and Spectrums too. Rather than a painful reliance on the spacebar to jump, this time everything is done from just one button. To jump up or drop down ledges, you simply press up or down. So how do you crouch or fire upwards now I hear you ask? Simple! Just hold down the fire button and Lance will fire in whatever direction you're looking in. It does take a little while to get used to, but just feels a lot more natural in the long run. And by now, you've obviously noticed there's no music to this version strangely either. Again, it could be counted as a sacrifice, as a lot of 8-bit and even 16-bit computers gave a choice of either music or sound effects, and this only gave the latter. Though it could be considered a bonus, as the Spectrum and Commodore 64 versions just played that base level theme over and over, which does get on your wick after a while, I must admit. But the big question you're probably asking is, is the ending as bad as the other two? And surprisingly, the answer is no. They've actually put some thought into it this time, so I'll shut up for a second and let you watch it. Congratulations, you have saved the Earth from an evil alien threat. Unfortunately, destroying the heart activates the self-destruct mechanism which blows up the planet. How sad. Methinks alongside Grange Hill on Friday the 13th, we've quite possibly got another candidate for darkest game over message. But this just inches in as it's a blooming congratulatory you win screen. This is regarded as your reward. Still, kudos to them for giving the ending a dark twist, especially for the 80s when everything was good triumphs over evil, Codswallop. Oh, and before I wrap things up, fun fact, the infamous Arnold Schwarzenegger Sylvester Stallone Aliens rip-off NES cover was actually drawn by Ocean Software originally for their version of the game. Konami, however, liked it so much they asked Ocean for a copy and put it on their, their NES port cover too. It's also why it looks like an awkward Photoshop job, as half the original image was covered in text. Look up the artist Bob Wakelin sometime. He's responsible for a number of famous game box art covers throughout the 80s and early 90s. You'll be surprised what he's done. But Contra wasn't the first, and certainly not the last Konami game to be ported over to British home systems. In our next episode, I'll be looking at arguably their most famous franchise of all, Castlevania! Will it fare any better than its NES counterpart? <sighs> Spoiler alert, no, it won't.